And that's what we, yes? Two things. One, a lot of the corruption in Armenia comes from the mentality of communist, mm -hmm. the communist influence. You know, you're still dealing with the transitional government, and a lot of the current leaders in that country have that mentality. And until they can phase out in our radicals that we call radicals, those of us uh, of our generation, for example, that have repatriated to Armenia and are trying to get in, I think there's there's a future, there's hope down the road. We have to be able to nurture the community and the country until that can happen. I think it's a day at a time. The second thing I wanted to ask you is, um, first of all, I have to say thank you for me personally, because you have convinced me if I wasn't convinced before that what we are doing at Maribuis is the Absolutely. right thing because you've got to educate these kids and give them a, a safe environment so that they don't, you know, they know to say no. But that's my question. Are the girls that, are, that you, the women that you encounter, that you discovered in your research, have any of them gone not willingly? Are they forced to go? Or are, is it more... Um, they're persuaded to go with the idea in mind that what they're going for is a legitimate purpose as opposed to what they right. end up with. Um, <coughs> most of the girls that we've encountered have been tricked um, to a certain degree. Some actually went voluntarily. There was a small amount. If you ask Ed Nick, the, the journalist I work with, he believes that most of them went knowing what to expect. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I agree that Tracking a victim is somebody who is unable to move freely. Their freedom of movement is being com has been compromised by their trafficker. By th and again, a lot of people in government, in the Armenian government and in the Emirates government, are involved in this ring. So it's not just prosecutor general either. But putting that aside, as far as getting uh, answering your question, most of the people that I encountered were tricked somehow. The force would only come. For instance, when they get to Russia, because what would happen was they would send them to Moscow. From Moscow, they would fly to the Emirates. They wouldn't actually, in most cases, wouldn't fly direct, even though there's a direct flight. And they would end up in Moscow for a few days, and then they would have paperwork done in Moscow, actually, because that was their country of origin. They would get these red passports. Now it's, it has to change, obviously. They've, I'm sure they've evolved somehow, but um, the Emirates has a, a law which is the woman has to be 31 years or older in order to travel in. So you would get these 18 year olds that have these passports that show they're 32, 33 years old. Mm -hmm. And they were the old Soviet red passports that they would be using to travel on. That was during the time that we were going. I'm not sure if those passports even have any validity today and how they're doing because we haven't done much on the on the, the Dubai side um, since then. You know, we just have some people on the ground there that just kind of get head counts for us every once in a while. And that's about it. Uh, so, yes, there, I didn't meet anybody that was actually forced or abducted or kidnapped, but I do know that there were flights that were coming out of, uh, I believe it's um, Edipoli, and there were cargo flights, and they were getting women on those direct to the Emirates. Mm -hmm. So whether, if somebody was going to be kidnapped, that would be the way to do it. Yes? Is there an Armenian church in Dubai? Yes, there is. And what is the church? <clears throat> okay, here's what the church, here's what the dead hide has to say at the church, because I went and saw him. Um, nice guy. Uh, and basically what he said was, my job is to teach them how to pray. So when they would come to see me, I would take them to the church. They would ask for money. They would ask for help. I would take them to the church, and I would show them how to pray, and then set them on their way. Aww. So that's what the Armenian church was doing at that time. When I left, the last trip I went, he did say that he was keeping a journal of who was coming. How they're helping, I'm not sure. But I do know this. I know that prior to, to landing in Dubai the first time, there was a young photojournalist. Um, his name was Shant. And he was involved in, he was being paid by an organization to research the, the problem. And he later on, I found that it was the Tashnaks that had actually financed him to a certain degree. When they found out who was involved in the trafficking ring, which was Armenian government officials and so on, they they called off the investigation, basically. And they found out there were people from the Emirates also. Because if you are not a native, you are there on a visa. You can be on a visa for 100 years. If they don't want you there, your visa is revoked and you're out. So Armenians have a lot to lose there as far as the business people there. And to them, money is more important than this. So 
Yes. It does exist. Uh, it does the Ayoka. Yeah. And traveling from Armenia to Turkey, yes. lately I did, I went before to Miragosia. Okay. Famous one. Mm -hmm. uh, how can she do it? I'm not sure. Which I'm Miragosia not sure. is this? Huh? Which Miragosia? Hidman Airport. Oh. Yeah. No, there, there are, there are, uh, most of the traffickers are Armenians. The ones that are trafficking Armenians are Armenians. Uh, I did have a couple Egyptian men coming to Armenia once, which we were following, and they were they were uh, looking for women to take to Egypt, and we got the police involved, and they because they weren't really part of the trafficking ring, they were receptive basically to get rid of us because there was no competition. Yes. How safe are you? I, I'm very safe. Um, I, for me, it's you know I get that question asked every once in a while. Don't you worry about your safety? I, I don't worry about my safety because I worry more about what will happen if I don't do this. Because my, my well-being, my sense of my mental state will... Hang on a second. My, my state of, of well-being will be bothered by that if I don't do something. So I don't worry about my situation. I've had threats. I've had, you know, things happen. But I'm still here, so that's what really counts. Any other questions? When did this trafficking start? This trafficking started right at the fall. I mean, once basically what happened was, as far as we understand, Armenians started going to Dubai for goods, to bring goods over. And they very quickly learned that there's a bigger profit made in sex trafficking than importing mm -hmm. goods from Dubai. So that's when it started, I think 1994. So if there, yes, any other questions? If there aren't, I just want to make you aware that on the back showcase over there are copies of this article. There's also copies of Desert Nights, which there, it's a $20 donation if you're interested. It's the book that's based off of this uh, videos that we did see. And there's some business cards back there for a website that I have called The Truth Must Be Told, which deals with some of the issues that I uh, address in Armenia and in the diaspora also. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you. All right, this was quite an informative afternoon, and uh, anyone that wants to talk to Ms. Gregorian or to Ara, or wants to support this organization, you have the bookmark. You can send your individual donations directly, or to support what Ara is doing. He's doing out of his own personal finances. It's, there's no organization that's helping him except the Shahanatali Foundation. Thank you very much, and we have some reception. Thank you.